Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and welcome to another time of Bible study uh, with us here at Bangham Heights Baptist Church in Cookville, Tennessee. I'm so glad that you've taken the time to tune in and to join us as we open God's Word here in just a minute. Now, before we begin, uh, let's go ahead and let's talk about the elephant in the room, okay? Uh, some of you will get that, and some of you went right over your head, all right? Uh, and so you may notice uh, the shirt that I'm wearing. And so let me give you just a little bit of a background here before we get into our Bible study, but it's actually going to make a, a little connection, okay? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had on, as I recorded, a Tennessee Volunteers uh, shirt. Some of you made a, a few comments about that choice of attire and, uh, and why I had on a Vols shirt, because for those of you that know me, I am not a Vols fan. I'm sorry. I, I know I just upset some of you out there, but I'm not a Tennessee Vols uh, fan. And, and so you say, well, why in the world would you wear a Vols shirt uh, when you're not a Vols fan. Well, to be honest with you, I bought that a while back at a Goodwill, you know, for like a buck, and I thought it'd make a good work shirt, so I use it sometimes just to, when I'm mowing the yard or, or doing outside work, you know, and I don't care to get it that dirty, okay? Now, you say, all right, well, that explains the Vols shirt. Well, why in the world, then, are you wearing an Alabama Crimson Tide shirt? So, for the record, no, I am not an Alabama fan as well, okay? Every now and then you might hear me say Roll Tide, but that doesn't mean that I am an Alabama fan, okay? So the reason for the shirt was simply uh, to annoy or to antagonize uh, my w wonderful, lovely wife, okay? My wife uh, is uh, an alum from the University of Tennessee. She is a Vols fan actually was in the marching band there years ago and and so I, I like to just you know give her a hard time and, and so I like to um, it, you know it, it's kind of like this uh, sometimes we're just asking for trouble okay and, and so um, sometimes we invite suffering into our lives that's exactly what I'm doing by wearing this shirt some of you are probably sitting there saying you know what how I, I can't believe that you would put on an Alabama shirt yes I know you should have saw the look that she gave me yesterday when I was buying this and she has no idea that I've recorded uh, this uh, this devotion in this shirt. So y'all pray for me uh, as she watches this. Um, I probably won't be in the room or even in the house because that that's uh, this is exactly what I'm doing. I am inviting suffering into my life. Now you see that's kind of the transition with this. All right, uh, for the past four weeks we have been going through First Peter chapter four, looking at verses twelve through nineteen. And, and we've looked at why Christians suffer. Uh, the whole letter of First Peter, he mentions suffering in every chapter. You know, sometimes in our life, we invite suffering into our own life. The choices that we make, the, the things that we do, the things that we say, uh, that's kind of that carnal suffering that we talked about back in in part one of why Christians suffer. But we make those choices, we make those decisions or those actions, those things that we say. And, and so we're just kind of, as I said, asking for trouble. And then there is suffering in our life because of that. Now, uh, last week we skipped ahead and we looked at verse 19 in chapter 4. Today, what I want us to do is go back to verses 17 and 18, and we'll look at those in just a minute. Now, as I was preparing for this, uh, listen carefully to what one pastor said. No suffering comes our way, but that which God has purposed for our good and for his glory. Uh, this past uh, Sunday, as we're going through Psalm 119, and we came to the section of verses 65 through 72 where the psalmist was talking about the affliction in his life. There was a time in his life when he was severely afflicted, but yet he came to understand that the affliction and the suffering that he was going through was God-ordained, that it was actually good for him. And so I would, I would say yes, I would agree with this pastor that 
Suffering is good for our life, and then suffering is ultimately for God's glory. And that's what we find here in 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, the pastor goes on to say this, God may not cause all things, but he does cause, cause all things to work together for good to those who love God and that are those who are called according to his purpose. Now that's Romans 8, 28. Sometimes we take that verse out of context. It doesn't say that all things are good. It says that all things work together for the good and then specifically for those who are uh, who are called those who love God and are called according to his purpose and so as a Christian and as a child of God I should not always view suffering as something that is harmful I, I should not have a view that suffering is is negative uh, but that but really though that it is a, a positive experience the uh, you should look at it really more as a fatherly chastisement. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about that, that as a child of God, the, the suffering in my life could be simply because God is is chastising me, but it is a, I'm a child of God and he is my heavenly father. And so it, I should look at it as something positive. And, and so it, listen, suffering is not something that we should just endure but suffering in the life of a Christian is something, uh, an experience in which we should also rejoice. Look in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 13. And we've talked about this in a previous session uh, in the Why Christians Suffer series. Our reaction to suffering is to be uh, to rejoice, not to rebel, but to rejoice. Now, I want to remind you of verse 16 before we get to 17 and 18. Look in verse 16. He says, Peter says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this, ma in this matter. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. Uh, I love how one commentator put it. When we meditate, when we begin in our finite minds to grasp in the concept of the greatness of our God, the suffering of our Savior, Jesus, and what he went through on the cross, the preciousness of his sacrifice, then we will glorify him for the privilege of suffering for his name's sake. And I love how that commentator put that, all right? Now, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. I understand that suffering here and now is no picnic. It's no walk in the park. But listen to what I'm about to say, though, and, and, and this is what we're going to look at in verses 17 and 18. Suffering here and now is no picnic, but it is vastly more desirable than entering into the suffering of eternal judgment. In other words, when we look at verses 17 and 18, and when we kind of put these in the context, because these two verses seem a little out of place. I, I, in verses 12, 13, 14, and 16, Peter is just rolling along with this theme and this concept of suffering. 17 and 18 are a little perplexing, and I'm going to try to uh, uh, to explain these verses uh, briefly. I, I don't want to really take them out of context. Um, but then when you get to verse 19, it's like he comes back to that suffering. And, and so when you look at these, understand what Peter is talking about here, that for the Christian, and while we may suffer here in this world, this suffering that we not just endure, but in, uh, it's an experience in which we should rejoice, even in the midst of this suffering, we understand that this suffering now, it, it, we would take it any day as compared to the suffering uh, for someone who enters eternity without Jesus. In other words, for an individual who dies lost and they are eternally judged 
and will spend eternity in that place that we refer to as hell. So let's just kind of break down verse 17 and then a little bit of 18. All right. So uh, look in verse 17. Look at what Peter writes here for the time has come. Now, I, I want to just kind of break down verse 17 uh, bit by bit. OK, for the time has come. Now, I, for some of you that may not know this, I have an older brother. I want to say that I have an older, uglier brother, okay? But we'll just say an older brother. I have an older brother. He's five, uh, right at five years older than me. And for the past five years, he's going on 45. Just a couple of months ago, I turned 40. So for the past five years, all I have ever heard from him is this. Well, your time's coming. Well, you just wait. Your time is coming. And he was talking about how ever since he turned 40, that it's been all downhill. That he started having uh, trouble with his knees and, and his hearing and his eyesight. And, and he's got aches and pains where he didn't have them before. But all I'm simply saying is he, time and time again, he would always say, you just wait. Your time is coming. Well, I hate to say this, but he's, he was right, okay? It seems like ever since I turned 40, just a couple of months ago, that I've started to have some issues out of my left knee and hurting and and I've noticed my hearing is is going bad my eyes are still okay but but listen though l look at what Peter says here all right he says for the time has come can I just say this that your time is coming it may not be today and it may it may not be tomorrow it may not be next week but here's what i'm simply saying eventually your time will be up there is coming a day when you're going to leave this whole world there is coming a day when you will stand before god in, in, in judgment. Now, for for myself, knowing that I'm a child of God, I have the assurance of salvation in my heart, in my life, then I don't fear standing before God. I, he is not just my creator, but I know that God is my redeemer. But you see, listen though, Peter says the time has come. The time has come for what? For judgment. The time has come for judgment. Now, that word judgment there can be translated a couple of different ways. That uh, one commentator says it like this. He says, the severe trial which would determine character. Now, I, I don't want to get off into this, uh, I, but I, the more I thought about that, and I thought about the past six weeks and then who knows the next couple of months that lay ahead of us. But maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you find yourself in a severe trial and it is determining your true character. If you are, in fact, a true child of God. But you see that word judgment there can also be translated to mean condemnation. Now, we understand that word condemnation and what immediately came to my mind was Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I know that Christ is in me, that I am in Christ Jesus. Now, there is still the condemnation for sin, but I, there is no condemnation for me because I understand that I am a sinner saved by grace. And now we understand from other biblical uh, texts uh, all throughout the word of God that when we find that word judgment, that judgment, it, there is a vast difference in judgment between a believer and a, an unbeliever or a non-believer. You see, saints are judged not for salvation, but we will be judged for our rewards. Now, when it comes to a sinner, in other words, a non-believer, somebody that is still uh, in their trespasses, somebody that is still lost in their sin, as a sinner, if you are to stand before God when your time has come and you are standing before God as your judge, then as a sinner who is still in their sin, then you will be judged according to your 
your works. Why? Because you rejected God's provision for salvation. In other words, you are not in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is not in you. And so you are uh, you are lost. And when you stand before God, when the time has come for judgment, then you have rejected God's plan of salvation in Christ Jesus and you will be judged accordingly. Now, I know what some of you are sitting there thinking, all right? Some of you are, some of you are sitting there saying, now, you, what you're telling me is this, that if I was to die lost, that if I was to die in my sin, I have rejected Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. You say, well, how can I trust you? How can I trust an individual who is wearing an Alabama shirt? You don't have to trust me, all right? Listen, you can read it for yourself. Pick up a Bible, and read John chapters 1, 2, and 3. Just read the word of God. Read over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Read what it says. But here's what I'm saying, though. It, look in 1 Peter chapter 4. For the time has come for judgment. There is coming a day when you will stand before God to give an account of your life. Let me give you a verse. I was reading this. Paul says this. Listen to what Paul said over in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. He, in other words, God, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus, okay, whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this. In other words, you can take it to the bank. Mark it down. It's going to happen. Okay. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. And I would encourage you to read over in Acts chapter 17 and, and put that more into the context. I'm not going to get into it right now, but you and I can understand that. And we can understand what God is, uh, is saying to you and I today, that there is an appointed day in which God is going to judge this world in righteousness, not our righteousness. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but by his righteousness and, and through Jesus and the death, his death upon the cross. But yet we also understand that he defeated death, hell of the grave. And through the resurrection, he raised him from the dead. And we have that assurance of that. Now, look back in 1 Peter chapter 4. For the time has come for judgment to begin where? To begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first. Now, some scholars, some commentators say, well, Peter is talking about the Jewish people here. God's, God's chosen people, the Jews. And, and he's uh, speaking in reference to the Jews who rejected Jesus as their Savior. I, I, personally, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I believe when Peter says here that the judgment to begin at the house of God, and by the way, he's not talking about a specific building. He's not talking about a temple or a sanctuary. But when he refers there to the house of God, then he is referring to the Christian to a, a New Testament believer. Remember, this whole letter is all about suffering. Christians who are now facing the fiery trials, they are facing persecution, they are facing suffering because they have chosen to bear the name of Christ. And since they bear the name of Christ, then they are, there is a, a, the time has come for this judgment, this condemnation. Now, let me give you how one, one pastor puts this. One, one pastor put it like this. He says, there is a relationship between our suffering in time and divine judgment. But just what is the connection? Peter may be saying the only judgment, or in other words, the only condemnation that a believer or a Christian will experience is the condemnation or the judgment 
of this world. Why? Because this world, the unbeliever or the non-believer, the wicked person, the ungodly person, this world, they reject Jesus Christ. And if they reject Christ, they will reject you, the Christian. And so you, in this life now, in this world, you are facing the condemnation or the judgment of of this world. Our condemnation or our judgment comes from this world for a short time because you and I as a Christian are living a righteous life in identification with Christ. But their judgment the sinner's judgment, the non-believer, their judgment comes from God for all of eternity because of their sin. Now, let's look at verse 17 and let's just break this down a little bit more. And I promise I'm going to wrap this up in about 10 minutes. So bear with me if you would. But listen, this is so important. Please hear my heart out, okay? I, I know there is some uh, silliness to this with, with me wearing a Bama shirt and, and all of this, all right? But just hear my heart. Hear me out. I, I don't want anybody to, to die lost. I, I, I want you to repent. And, and so uh, when you look at these verses, look at what he says here. There are two questions that are asked now in verses 17 and 18. Let, let's look at these two questions. Peter says in verse 17, the time has come. Your time is coming. Judgment to begin at the house of God. It will begin with the Christian, the believer. And if it begins with us first, now look at this question in verse 17. What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, I want to start with that last part, the gospel of God. It is not my gospel. It is not Peter's gospel. It is not Paul's gospel. It is the gospel of God. What does gospel mean? Gospel simply means good news. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. You know what the gospel of God contains? The gospel of God contains the grace of God. It talks to us about the righteousness of God. It tells us how to have peace with God. It is the pardon from God. It reveals to us justification from uh, before God and how we can have acceptance with God. It is the gospel of God that has been committed into the life of the child of God. But listen, the gospel of God was not just given for the child of God to believe and to accept for themselves, but to give away to a non-believer to in other words to share the gospel of God it is the light into the darkness and we are to share that light but look at the question though what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God in other words we could ask it like this what's going to happen to that individual if they die lost what will be the end result of a person who rejects Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, again, I, I say this, I say this out of love. Hear, hear this from my heart. There's no other way to heaven. There is one way. There is only one way. There is one way to heaven, and that is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You put your faith and trust in him. You repent of your sin. You say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you were buried, but then you arose again the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And you are alive and you're seated at the right hand of the heavenly father forevermore. Lord, I believe you're coming back. But what will be the end of those who do not obey? I'm going to tell you what the end is eternal damnation. I'm not saying that to scare anybody. I'm simply trying to say what Peter is telling us here. Peter, remember these verses seem a little out of place. Verses 17 and 18 are a little perplexing because Peter's been talking about this suffering in the life of the Christian. Christian, here's the encouragement for you. The suffering that you are experiencing now in this life is nothing compared 
to the suffering that awaits those who die in their sin. And I say that with all seriousness. Please hear my heart. Please understand what I'm saying. That if you die lost, if you reject Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and if you die in your trespasses, you die in your sin, and you stand before God in your judgment, and, and God Almighty says, depart from me, I never knew you, you are not a child of God, then I'm, t I'm here to tell you, and I'm telling you with all, with all sincerity, that your time is coming. The time is coming when you will stand before God for judgment to begin. It will begin first with that Christian, but then it will go to the non-believer. And what will be your end? If you do not obey the gospel of God, obey the gospel of God. Simply trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whatever difficulty, child of God, that you may be facing right now. And I realize in, in, in these times, I realize that there are children of God. There are Christians out there right now who are facing sufferings. You're facing difficult times. But can I just say that this little bit of suffering, whatever that you're facing right now, that the eternal suffering of an unbeliever is simply uncomparable. Our suffering right now may seem very great, but it does not hold a candle to what lies ahead to those who die lost. Let me give you some verses and I'm going to wrap this up. I read these verses last week and I think I want to somehow connect these verses to what Peter is saying in, in verses 17 and 18. Luke chapter 12, in the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, and I say to you, my friends, and I love how Jesus calls us friends there in verse 4. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Don't, don't, don't be afraid of the suffering of, an, of a person, somebody that may bring pain and suffering into your life, even if they kill you, after they kill, that's it. Listen to what he says here. Verse five, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Salvation begins when you fear God. I, I don't mean a fear as in God's going to strike me down dead right now if I don't trust in him. It's a, it's a healthy kind of awe and respect and reverence of who God is. That God is the creator of this universe. But that God is also the giver and sustainer of life. And eternal life comes through Jesus Christ, his son. Verse 18, and I'm done. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Verse 18 there's a word there, and that word is righteous. Verse 18 is a, a direct quote. Peter quotes Proverbs eleven thirty one, 31. And that word righteous there, I want to make sure we all understand that your righteousness, my righteousness, I am not getting to heaven by my righteousness. You will not make it to heaven in your own righteousness. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. The, when he talks about righteous there, then the reference here is it's God's righteousness through his son, Jesus Christ. The propitiation, the sacrifice that he made upon that cross, dying for our sin. And so when he says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? There's the second question. There's two questions. In verse 18, that question is pretty much the same as in verse 17. Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I'm going to tell you where they will not appear. The sinner and the ungodly, they will not appear with Jesus in glory. Where will they appear? They'll be in that place called hell. They will appear 
with that one that we call Satan. And again, I don't say that to scare anybody. I simply want you to understand what the Word of God says. Verse 19, I want you to understand the connection here. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. That first word, and for those of you that are members and you've heard me say this before at Bangham Heights here, therefore, when you see the word therefore, you are to ask yourself, what is that therefore? In other words, verse 19 connects to verses 17 and 18. So in 17 and 18, he's talking about the fact, and it's a fact, that there will be suffering that we cannot imagine, an eternal suffering. Now think about this. Eternity is a very long time. Eternity is not just a time, it is a place. You have two options. The eternal suffering in that place of hell, a place of torment. Or the other option is that place that we call heaven, to be with King Jesus, a place called glory. Well, how do you get there? Verse 19, you commit your soul. Commit the keeping of your soul to him. Trust in Jesus. The Bible says there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that all throughout your word, there are warning signs to tell us today of the reality of, of suffering that is to come to anyone who rejects Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So, Father, I'm praying right now, Lord, that if there is anyone who is watching this, anyone who is listening, Lord, that if they have never trusted in you, they've never placed their trust in you, Lord, they that if they need to believe and receive you into their heart, Lord, that they'll do it right now. Lord, they'll simply say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess. I confess Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to come into my heart. I'm committing my life to being your disciple. I believe you died on the cross for my sin, but that you arose from the dead, giving me a blessed hope of eternal life in that wonderful, glorious place that we call heaven. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your love. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I apologize for going a little bit long for a, a midweek uh, devotion time. But I trust and pray that God has spoke to you and that you understand that there is a suffering for all of eternity if you reject Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. May God bless you. May God keep you safe. May God keep you healthy. And I do want to say just one thing, and this is for my, my good pastor friend, uh, brother Tim Miles, who is a big Alabama fan, roll tide.